Reporting in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Better watch what I say. Um, so this is the uh, Thanksgiving week, which is a big deal in this culture. We have we rarely celebrate really quite the way we do with this season. This season to celebrate with loved ones. Uh, which sounds so lovely, doesn't it? But um, many people, some of us here, have complicated relationships with family and loved ones. So if this is the case for you, it may not be such a lovely season. And I know for many, it's a season of uh, feeling kind of troubled. Um, because in, instead of bringing with it uh, kind of love and refuge and relaxation, it brings conflict and aversion and stress to varying degrees. Perhaps not, but perhaps so. And uh, it's not addressed so much, so I thought it would be useful to look at this in relation to gratitude, the practice of gratitude, and how we, how, we, uh, how we practice with gratitude in this season. The, uh, the very elements of Dharma practice with samsara are the same conflict and aversion and stress. And um, the human realm is marked by conflict, aversion, and stress. This is the first noble truth. So, um, so let's look at this a little bit more closely. This uh, samsara that we all are learning how to work with, to live in with skill, and with flexibility, and with humor, and um, wisdom compassion. Loved ones. This phrase, loved ones, is not always the phrase that comes readily to mind when thinking about the family. Some do have family relationships that are loving and maybe even fun, uh, that are close and a refuge of sorts, that are congruent with how we feel about ourselves and where we come from that feel close and where we feel safe. We're able to talk about conflicts with each other when they come up and listen to each other and understand ourselves and each other better through this process. Conflict is inevitable. Um, it leads to when we are able to listen to each other with an open heart and patience, it can lead to a deepening of the bond between us. But if we, if we are immediately hurled into our own uh, anger or the anger of the other person and listening doesn't happen, then it leads to conflict, leads to alienation. Uh, personally and collectively, and we're, we're seeing this happening all around us now. So family relations can be really challenging. And even more recently formed non-family, but someone close, uh, somewhat close relationships, uh, whether they're friends or uh, the spiritual community, workplace dynamics, can come to mirror our original family patterns. We can feel left out at a time like this, right? not valued, judged, resentful, put down, harried. So there are a lot of challenges in the holiday season. And what are they? Well, money is the first thing that came to my mind. It can really stress if we're all, if we're living fairly close to the line, we, it, we can become even more stressed by money concerns conflicting priorities with those we are close with. 
wanting something different, each person in a family wanting it to be slightly different. Uh, the communications can really break down. The varying expectations of what's going to happen on the festival days. The uneven workload that comes in a lot of families with the holidays. Um, the, uh, the provoked, uh, our, our inner critics can get really provoked at this time, just like all the other times. <laughs> it's not, maybe it's no different now. Uh, geographical distance can also contribute. If we don't see family members but for once or twice a year, and then suddenly we're all together for a week, it's, it's challenging because uh, working out harmonious ways of, of co-living take time, takes time. So these sudden changes can be uh, difficult. Um, crappy weather can be problematic if we're all stuck in the house together and we didn't plan on it and we don't know how to handle that time. So these are all various themes. I'm probably leaving out a number of things like how each person re relates to the pets in the house, <laughs> right? <laughs> All kinds of details in our, in our homes. And what gets acted out? How do we act out all of this? We get busy and absorbed in our own tasks, and uh, we may not practice as much. And I heard this tonight already in uh, somebody from somebody who's not able to practice so much because you know in their usual way because too much is going on so zazen falls away and with it we can more more readily forget our vow to be present to be aware to be careful to be kind and to notice to serve to be of service we forget our bodhisattva intentions Especially if we have a lot of distress, we have a lot of uh, uh, difficult feelings at a time like this. We can really get, as, as we always do if we get sick or if there's some, we're suffering, it's harder to pay attention to other people and, and keep them as uh, central in our concerns. So thinking about this recent Thanksgiving feast, uh, I just want to have a, a little checklist. So did you notice who did the preponderance of the work to get dinner on the table? Did you notice who bought and paid for the ingredients? Did you notice who cooked? Did you notice who served? Who cleaned up? Who packed up the leftovers? Did you notice compliments whether they were given and received. And whose contributions were taken for granted. So this is one of the ways that we can very actively practice during the holidays. Just keep an eye on these different, uh, different aspects of the celebration. Did you know, do you notice during something like this, your attitudes toward food, does it change? Is it kind of constant? How patient are you with yourself and with others? How well do you listen? If there's a, if there's a, a large family table how much listening is going on, how much show, shouting over each other, especially when you get to politics. So these are the same things we notice all the time in our lives, paying attention, being mindful, being aware of what is. And again, in, uh, intending to um, align with our vow to stay open and present. Or maybe you spent the holiday alone. Or maybe you were a person invited because you didn't have anywhere else to go. So 
So what was that like? What came up for you? How did you practice with it? So we're always noticing what, what's going on inside and outside. Inside us and outside us. Inside our, our gut, inside our minds and hearts. And what's going on in the environment around us. And noticing our mental narratives about how things all work together and are constituted. This, this is how we always practice Dharma. How things all come together. All things unfold together. So if we enter a group situation with an attitude, that is going to affect how that uh, interaction goes. It contributes to the direction, the tone of it. So taking our attention away from our personal preferences and narratives and staying present to holiday time as Samu work practice. The thing about Samu, if, if you're not familiar with it, that's what we call work practice, is that it's very joyful. I mean, it's usually pretty joyful and, and that comes down to the fact that you only have one thing to do. It's, it's not a time to be scattered. And there's something wonderful about having one thing to do. So to be able to look at that uh, in terms of a family situation in a, in a holiday time, what is your one thing to do? What is your basic intention? What vow do you take as you head into it? It makes a big difference. You're laying claim to these moments of life as the only moments that you have some say about how you conduct yourself, what you're putting into the whole, the whole feast. So, what is to be done and what's needed? There's this phrase, I use it fairly regularly, called enlightenment must function. Meaning, what good is practice that clarifies our, uh, that, that uh, makes it clearer what's going on? What good is it unless it functions it for us and how we behave, what we bring forward into the world? So how does gratitude function? Coming back to gratitude. And what forms does gratitude take, no matter what's going on? How about um, receiving every moment? You know, what, what marks gratitude when we're feeling grateful? We're, we're really receiving, really present. when we feel happy or when we dread or when we're feeling afraid or confused, if we turn, if we remember the practice of gratitude and regard everything as a gift, if we are people of the way, everything is a gift. That's one thing we're, we're willing to say, okay, I'll practice with that. That's the heart of the practice. Everything is a gift. Am I willing to receive the gifts that these circumstances are offering me? So practicing gratitude helps us to enjoy an open mind and be willing to feel the vulnerability that comes along with it. You think about how you feel, how do you feel in the body when you're feeling gratitude? We can bring the, the four foundations of mindfulness to this particular word, state, practice. So how do you feel in your body when you're experiencing gratitude, something you call gratitude? What, what do you feel? I'm, I'm going to open that up for single words. What do you feel in your body when you feel gratitude? Relaxation. Relaxation. Smile. A smile. Warmth. 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 Lightness. Lightness. And the present moment. It's right here and now. 
So it's in the present. Like, ah, right? Is it pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Is it neutral? Gratitude. Pleasant. Pretty pleasant. What's the, what's the general uh, uh, energy of gratitude? So is it stirred up? Is it expansive? Is it condensed? Soft. Hmm? Soft. Soft. Expansive. Expansive. Surrounding. Light. Inclusive. Uplifting. Uplifting. And then the fourth is uh, mental formation. So, you know, we, we often say, well, that's the, uh, the narrative. Well, it's more. It's everything. Mental formations is anything we notice. But it, that includes the narrative. And the narrative, there's, all, there's often a narrative in gratitude. What is that? What are the words that go along with that? Thankful. This is so wonderful. Thank you. Here we are. Right? I don't know, whatever it is, but you notice, you notice what's going on in your mind. So practicing is especially helpful. Especially helpful when uh, things are really difficult. So being aware of the physicality of gratitude, you can notice what happens when uh, there's a very difficult situation and you remember, how can I feel gratitude here? Besides skepticism, <laughs> which is a distinct feeling like gratitude, really? <laughs> but, but just to raise the question, where's gratitude? And even the thought brings some openness bring some spaciousness. Even the thought of, even if you don't even know how you can feel grateful for something that's going on in the family or in the setting, even the thought, how do I practice with this, is an opening. How can I relate to this in a way that brings benefit to me and maybe to others. So it's a really, that's, that's where uh, the, uh, um, practice really meets, meets reality in real everyday life in samsara. How do I practice with gratitude with this difficulty? Some of which can go way back and be awfully familiar, especially in your family. Oh boy, here we go again. So usually what we do is we are grateful for things. So what things are you grateful for? Food, warmth, a warm coat, a body that's working, more or less. <coughs> A mind that's working, more or less, <laughs> usually, sometimes. Anesthesia. Anesthesia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All kinds of things. We are very, very um, uh, fortunate in all of the things we have in this life, in this particular place and time. Um, we can say thank you for experiences. And you may think back on wonderful experiences that you've had. In times when you're feeling crummy, you just remember, oh, but it's not always been this way. Oh yeah, I, can, I remember that. It's how it felt before. Or after a particularly difficult experience, you can think of all the things that came out of it that actually were very beneficial. So that's, that's um, being, thank you for experiences. And we can say thank you for problems. 
And that's what I'm also talking about here, saying thank you for the problems. This is the path. This is the first noble truth. We're not going to practice with, with anything. We're not going to leave out any of the noble truths in our practice. And the first one is the, pro the problems, difficulties. The problems keep us paying much more complete attention with a mind that's not filled with aversion and, and um, it's not filled with what we already know. Because usually when there's a problem, there's a lot we don't know. We don't know how to handle it. We don't know what somebody meant by such and such. We don't know what's going to happen now. A mind, we bring a mind motivated by what happens when we don't pay attention. When I'm not paying attention, um, I just remember once I was so I was so filled with myself and my my joy of my culinary skills. I was showing somebody at a session how to slice fruit, and I was just so into it that I sliced my finger, you know, like the whole tip off. Then <laughs> what? He sewed it back on. <laughs> One thing led to another, right? <laughs> Um, but that's what happens when not paying attention. And as we age, paying attention becomes ever more physically important to really pay attention when we take a step, to really watch where we're going, to look both ways before we drive into the intersection, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So, um, the, uh, we use gratitude, we use difficult situations as an opportunity for insight into our habitual ways that are narrowing our life, to see how we push away some feelings, some emotions, some thoughts, some meanings that we don't want to be part of our life, and it's a really powerful insight when we notice something along these lines. Because as long as we pick and choose and hold on to and push away what we'll have in our life and what we won't, we live with fear, tension, stress, dread, and narrow who we are. We, we, are, we narrow our life in service to maintaining, at all costs, a sense of a, a self, of little me. Right? Uh, a sense that's really separate from a whole lot of life. This takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of energy to stay defended against what's going on, to maintain a narrow focus like that. This restricts what we can contribute in our life and restricts the sense of fulfillment that comes with making a contribution. I mean, one of the things that's so wonderful about a Sangha is that each one of you contributes something that none of the others contribute. And we can, we can in a Sangha, all of whom are practicing being aware and appreciative, we can really appreciate what each person brings. You know, as I look at you, I just like, yes, each of you contributes to, to a very rich community of uh, sharing insight and wisdom and skill. So, um, and as we, as we um, develop a sense of confidence that comes out of having been willing to um, bear, to forbear, to, to put up with, to experience all kinds of parts of our lives, there is a kind of courage that comes, a kind of faith in our own fiber. We call it character work. That leads to being genuine, that leads to being honest and steady and reliable. Just like the Dharma, the Dharma is really reliable. It 
having this kind of confidence is, is an incredible treasure. We come to regard ourselves with respect and all living things with respect. That's a real treasure. When we live with courage and openness, we discover how uh, we're each bringing something to this feast. Every, every day, and that's part of what gratitude, the practice of gratitude can really remind us and help us do. And gratitude functions in many ways. It, the gratitude is beyond words and language. It's another demonstration of what that means and when we talk about um, Zen as a practice outside of words and letters. Well, so is gratitude. <laughs> It's direct. So we can, always, we can always notice how we experience gratitude. What are the markers that tell you that you're feeling grateful? Is there ever a situation where you don't feel gratitude? How do you express gratitude? So gratitude needs a wide open space in order to arise and come forward. And that's where the Zazen comes in. Zazen, which can be so trying to sit still. You know, we're going into Sashin pretty soon. And those of us who are going to do it may even be giving some thought to those first few, the first day of Sashin where you're sitting there and you go, oh, no. <laughs> How am I going to do this? <laughs> but then after you relax, there's nothing like it. There's just nothing like it. It's such a treasure. The wide open space. I want to recommend a movie that I just watched called The Swimmers. It's on Netflix. I'm watching it right now. And um, it's about uh, a couple of uh, Syrian, Syrian uh, sisters who were swimmers. And they, uh, they try to escape from Syria, and they get caught. And the, the way that they survive is through swimming. Uh, it's a, that's a real simplification of what it's about. But if you can watch it, I don't want to tell you anything more. But, but there is a scene where they, they get to the end of this impossible situation. You know, you're, you're just, there's no way they can survive. And, but they do. They do. And, and I thought of Zazen, I thought of Zen practice like that. And they get to, they get to out of the water and they're, they're sobbing on the beach. Sobbing with disbelief and belief. It's, it's wonderful and it, it's, that's gratitude. You know, I saw it after I was thinking about this talk and I thought, oh yeah, there's gratitude. <laughs> there's an example of gratitude. It doesn't always look the same. So, um, gratitude may be the furthest thing from what we actually feel when things are tough. But it is good medicine. It doesn't take long to bring its relief. So even if you don't even know how you're going to feel it, bring it to mind. <laughs> Right on the spot. How can I be grateful for this? And once we commit to bringing gratitude to this moment, we notice that there is an immediate uh, diminishment of suffering. Immediately there's a little bit more space. And it turns the conventional response to trouble upside down, which is one reason why we say Zen is the practice of upside down. This is an example of it. The, uh, the simple form of this teaching uh, is the title of Maizumi Roshi's book. Uh, Maizumi Roshi, who is my Dharma grandfather, your Dharma great grandfather, um, it, his, his uh, book is simply called Appreciate Your Life. It's appreciating everything about it. It's 
So heading into this season, may we all uh, practice with gratitude that which is obviously lovely and that which is much more difficult. And, um, and we'll do it together in the Sunday.